Hi, Jeanette. Hi there. How are you? Good, thank you. I was on a, another Zoom waiting for you, but but I must have been on the wrong link. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I think we got it all figured out. So all right. nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Where are you located? I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I'm currently in Calgary, Alberta, but I'm polyhomerous or live a mobile lifestyle, so I'm travel around a lot. But this is kind of my home base when I am when I am here. A true nomad. I like it. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's great to meet you. I and and I want to kick everything off in our conversation with living through the last three years with COVID's been quite a thing. How mm -hmm. did you get through it, and how has it changed the way that you live your life now? Oh, interesting. Okay, well, we'll dive right in. So basically, <laughs> um, my business didn't change very much at all because I've been online and you know moving around a lot in um, in terms of my business. So I've been online for. A decade. So in terms of the business, it didn't change a lot. What I did, you know, find very challenging, I was down in the States and uh, when everything shut down. Um, so of course, like everyone, it was a lot of wondering and avoiding the fear mongering and dealing with the, the what isness of it and trying to sort out. I spent a lot of my time supporting other people and figuring out how to pivot a lot of clients and, and just people in general, because there was a lot of people who were uh, struggling with now what, now what do I do? So reimagining how their business could look, how they could look, what could be possible. I think it was actually in many ways, a really good uh, wake up call for people to not take things for granted, to not just kind of flow with the status quo and to, choose in very consciously to who do I want to be and what do I want to do in the world? What do I want to contribute? So from that perspective, I thought it was very helpful. Of course, there was lots and lots and lots of downsides, but um, what I, <laughs> I then drove, because I tend to drive quite a bit. So I drove back from Florida to Calgary on in May doing what I call the zombie apocalypse run uh, through nine states. It was fascinating to feel the different energies and hear the different conversations about COVID on the way back, <laughs> including, I have to say this, it was, I was in a restaurant, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was Montana. And in the other room, I heard a woman saying, it's my constitutional right not to wear a mask. And I was so tempted to walk into the other room and say, I know I'm a Canadian, but I can pretty much guarantee you there's nothing about masks in the constitution. I can pretty much guarantee you that. Um, but anyway, see, it was it was a fascinating time in many ways, but also very frustrating because of all of the fear mongering. And I think what it led to was a whole bunch of us versus them mentality yeah. between the political environment and COVID. And we're still climbing back out of that. And I think that what I see now, aside from everybody having kind of low grade PTSD or very extreme PTSD from the whole thing that isn't being acknowledged and dealt with, I don't think, um, there is there is uh, still a hesitancy to reconnect. Like I'm seeing in live events, people are not coming back fully uh, in networking, you know, live networking. It's, it's challenging to get people back out. You kind of thought, oh, yay, people, I can come back. But there is a hesitation that I find fairly sad and a hesitancy to really kind of connect. It's like we almost forgot how. And so now what I'm doing quite a bit of is really supporting people more on the internal front. My business is a lot about the inner and outer game of business, but it's a lot of remembering who we are uh, at our core and how do we really connect with others and reinforcing the connection we have versus the disconnections. Um, so I think on a business front, there was lots of opportunity as there always is in every crisis of course there's lots of uh, decimation as well uh, but I think it really made people pause and and think about who do I want to be I'm a little concerned you know I'm a, I'm a little sad we're drifting back away from that and back into just kind of business as usual trying to go back rather than forward uh, with some new choices but um yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, you but 
interesting you, time. It was an interesting time all the way around. Yeah, you answered it very well. And as the why whisperer, I want to get to the exact essence of what you do on a daily basis. I'm going to put you in front of a bunch of third graders at career day. One of the kids looks up and says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? <laughs> That's a great question. I got to steal that for my podcast. There you um, go. Okay, so so um, what, I, what I tell them is that I help people figure out what matters to them in the world that they want to really turn into a business so that they can make a difference. And I think your why is, this might not be the third grader level, but the why, our why is the intersection of what we're healing from our past and what we long for the, for our future. Some people call it purpose or mission, but I think those terms are laden. So I just call it your why, why you do what you do, but it's not what you do. It's not, it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's our purpose. It's why we're here. And so what I do is support, especially women entrepreneurs in figuring out how to make a difference in the world and make a profit. So when you were in the third grade, what did you want to be when you grew up? Third grade. Oh, well, you know what? I think I came out of the womb with a briefcase. I've been entrepreneurial my whole life. Literally, my first franchise was when I had a lemonade stand and I saw the other three corners were really busy and I couldn't get to them. So I went and got the other three TV trays out of our living room and put friends on those trays with other lemonades and made signs. And we split the profits 50-50. That was my first franchise when I was six. Uh, my first business was a daycare in a housing tenement that I lived in. I was 11 and my first employee was nine. Um, so I've been entrepreneurial my whole life. I think uh, when I was younger, one of the things that I wanted to do was kind of reform how we taught. Uh, I think we do a disservice to school kids because we don't teach them about life we don't teach them about money and you know like it just saddens me when I go to McDonald's and I give someone twenty dollars and my bill's 950 and they take out a calculator to figure out the change like come on how how are we preparing people for life if that's the case so that's what I wanted to do was reform education now I'm I'm still kind of doing that I'm doing a lot of you know teaching adults um but it's more in the realm of how do we make a difference through our business. So tell me where you were born and raised and what these seeds that were put into you to want to be an entrepreneur and to want to help people. Um, so I was born and raised in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, I moved 27 times in the first 29 years of my life. So I've been mobile most of my life. Uh, it was a 15 year period where I had a house and I was power nesting. But other than that, I've been pretty mobile. Um, Actually, a lot of the seeds that were placed or fostered came through a lot of adversity. I grew up with a very challenging childhood, mother with mental health and addiction issues. She was married five times, uh, lots of violence, lots of, of um, you know, lots of addiction, etc. So lots of chaos. I grew up mostly as an only child. Uh, so I became the adult really early. And um, took care of my mom and took care of her things. So I, that's part of where, what fostered the entrepreneurial spirit. At one point I wanted to book Heidi and I asked my mom, beg, 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 beg. And she finally turned around and yelled one day, no, we can't afford it. And I was shocked, not by that, because I heard that a lot, but by the look on her face. And I remember to this day, even though I was only almost five, I remember seeing the look of shame and fear and sadness and regret and swearing to myself that I never wanted to see that look on anyone else's face. And that was really the seed that planted the desire to support people um, in being able to have a yes life instead of a no life. And so basically for 40 years, I've been helping entrepreneurs do that. So who would you consider a hero in your life? Somebody that's been kind of an inspirational fuel for you? Uh, quite a few, actually. There's there's one who I was with an international student group for a while, and there was a, a man named Reverend Park, and he was he had an indomitable spirit. And he used to say, Cha, you must live a story life, a story life. And that always that stuck with me as probably the best piece of advice I've ever gotten in my life. I I think that it, on two fronts, one, we, we kind of live and die by the stories we tell about ourselves and other people in the world. Either they're positive and take us closer to who we want to be, what we want to do and what we want to have, or they take us further away. And we're 
in charge of those stories. So that's one side, but the other side is leave stories. We can't leave anything else. It's not like we can leave, you know, much else, maybe some money, maybe some, you know, intellectual property, but leave a legacy of stories and live a legacy of stories. And that's had me really commit to what I call living out to my edges and supporting others in doing that because it, if you don't have a story life, you have a boring life. And so I think that that helps me live a full and interesting life. And that's to me really the best thing we can do. So if you can meet anybody alive on the planet right now and spend some time with them, who would it be? Ooh, it, it would be a toss up between, mm, oh, there's so many entrepreneurial heroes. It, it would be a toss up between um, Tesla and, or sorry, um, Elon Musk and, um, Virgin, uh, Richard Branson. Oh, Branson, yeah. One of those two, probably. Uh, although the Obamas would be high on my list, um, yeah. perhaps Sarah Blakely of Spanx. Um, there's there's quite a few people that I would love to love to meet, but mostly what would fascinate me is how they think, because um, they think differently, and I love learning how people think to create different results. So all of these people obviously have a high level of motivation. What is that for you? What gets you out of bed? What gets you to accomplish what you want to get done with your life day by day? Um, a great, another great question, man, you've been doing this for a while. I can tell <laughs> uh, so, um, I, my why. I think that our why is really, really critical, not only to differentiating ourselves in the marketplace because people buy why we do what we do. And it's the only thing that differentiates us from the millions of people who do, do what we do. But it also gets us out of bed in the morning. Like I want to be an inspiration to maturepreneurs everywhere that it's not too late. Uh, it's never too late to make your millions, to make your mark. And the BF story of, oh, it's too late, I'm too old now or whatever is just that, it's a story. So it gets me out of bed to get my budding gear to, to make an impact, make a difference, get that message out there. Uh, because I have seen and experienced too much of the despair of the the can't life, you know, the, the story of no, I can't, no, it's too late, no, it, it's uh, too, not enough this or too much that or whatever that not enough story is. Um, so that literally wakes me up some mornings with uh, ideas floating around almost always an hour before my clock set and that annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> So what's been one of your favorite success stories that you've been involved with? Oh, well, there's lots and they're kind of little and big. I could tell you stories about helping people, you know, break seven figures and things like that. But really, one of my favorite stories is Elaine, a coach that I worked with who wanted to grow her coaching practice. But really what she ended up doing is stepping into who she really wanted to be and she sold her house everything she owned she literally has three boxes left of everything that she owns she packed up every she bought a, a uh, one of those camper vans and travels around the country now speaking and coaching and meeting up with her boyfriend at marinas because he lives on a boat and she loves 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 her life like she never has before that to me is a huge success. So yes, she got more clients. Yes, she's, um, you know, doing well in her business, but more she's doing well in her life. She switched from building her life around her business to building her business around her life. And to me, that's a significant win. Absolutely, it is. So let me ask you this. If you have a dream tonight, you run into the 20 year old version of yourself and you could give that younger version of you a piece of advice based on the wisdom you've gained in your life so far. What would you tell that young version of you? Mm. Uh, well, there's probably a few things. One is um, work on getting over your approval issue faster because it stops you through your life more than it should. Uh, and is probably, I think, the most devastating issue. And I did work on it a lot. Like I took a lot of personal development training. I'm a facilitator. I've done, you know, taught coaching certification programs, et cetera. But I'd have, I'd have encouraged that person to let that go a lot sooner because I think it takes a lot of our power, a lot of our spirit, a lot of, a lot of everything. That would be one thing. The second thing I would, would probably tell that person at this point is, 
uh, balance off better having a story life that you love and being fiscally responsible. I think that there would be a little bit of advice about that. Um, although I wouldn't trade my life, I wouldn't change much, but I think that that could have been attended to more. Um, and I think the third thing that I would say is um, call in more support sooner. You know, we mostly grow up with, especially women, do it yourself, you're the giver, you know, et cetera, et cetera, putting ourselves last on the list. And not calling in support sooner has constrained my growth and my impact and my reach and all sorts of things. You know, when they build a high rise, they dig a big, deep foundation for that sucker. And so my goal is to build a high rise. And so I would have said call in support sooner. So of all of the things that you've done and accomplished in your life, what are you the proudest of? Um, I would say that I have lived that story life. I have swum with great whites. I've ziplined on three continents. I was a whitewater rafting guide. I traveled with the carnival. Like there's not many things that you can say that I haven't done or experienced or, you know, um, had as kind of part of my experience, uh, traveled to 34 or 36 countries so far and counting. But I think as much as that delights me, the thing that I would say I'm most proud of is the people I've loved, that I've loved a lot of people and supported a lot of people. And that makes me very proud. So as somebody that's well-traveled, that you have a nomadic spirit, what was one of the places on this planet that you saw that surprised you the most that you absolutely loved? Uh, I'd have to say Iguazu Falls in, in South America. Uh, there's many, many places that are beautiful. I've, I've seen everything from deserts to ice caps to, you know, everything in between. But that is probably a piece of nature that is the most impressive, the most... I think spiritual and, and, you know, I had fun on it. We did a, um, an airboat trip up it and swam in the waterfalls and all sorts of things, but mostly it's just absolutely incredible of all of the waterfalls I've seen in, in the whole world. It's by far the most impressive. Uh, and it's an incredible place. It's in the jungle. There's three countries that meet three rivers that meet there. Um, so, and I love South America. I love Latin cultures and stuff. So that whole trip, I traveled around South America for seven months. That whole trip was one amazing experience after another, but that's, that's the place that is the most, mm, I don't know, not quite home, but the most amazing to me. So if you could witness any event that took place on this planet with your own eyes in <laughs> history, what, what would you love to have been there to see firsthand? Huh. Wow, you make people think fast. <laughs> 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 okay, any event. Huh. Oh, my God. History is flicking through my head well, at a rapid pace. I, I, huh. Hmm. Yeah, you know, nope, not that, not that, not that. I, 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 I think, you know, I, I don't know a lot about it, but I think the thing that I probably would have liked to have been in the room for, there was a, a Congress of Elders where they brought together people like um, uh, Desmond Tutu and um, um, like Mandela, like those kinds Mandela, of Mandela, thank you. I was like, the and that other man, Mandela, and all of those people came together and talked about how to solve some of the world's problems and, and what we need to do. And they brought, you know, centuries of, of wisdom together in one room. I think that would have been so fascinating to, to see and be part of and to listen to. Yeah, that's a great okay. answer. Yeah, you know, and I do a lot of jazz interviews and I always joke around that all of the jazz elders are like those magic people in Empire Strikes Back in Cloud City. They're all sitting around in this room and they're just <laughs> kind of looking at us minions trying to say, OK, this is what you need to do. That's a perfect like Rockwellian painting right there. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> so everyone has a perception of you, family, friends, clients, colleagues, but you run the show. 
What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Oh, my Lord. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, uh, you get full marks for having completely different and deeper and better questions than any other podcast host I've ever been on. Um, my perception of me is determined, big heart, intelligent, uh, kind of a unique synthesis of capabilities, um, <laughs> eminently flawed, resistant, stubborn, and not done by a long shot. I like it. What a great description. If anyone wants to reach out, find out more about you, hire you, where do they go? What do they do? Uh, first of all, hey, yay, come and hire me. That'd be awesome. I'm at bodacity.ca is my website. Bodacity is a word I didn't make up. Bold plus audacious, B-O-D-A-C-I-T-Y. Dot ca. Uh, my Facebook group is the Purpose and Profit Sisterhood. Uh, my podcast is the Purpose and Profit Sisterhood podcast. And basically, just go look for Jeanette Anderson, and you will find me. If I'm, if it's not someone with blue hair and looking kind of audacious, it's probably not me. <laughs> I would say so, Jeanette. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much for your story and for opening up. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. You're fabulous. Thank you. My pleasure. You too. Take care.